Wallachia in the 15th century was an unstable region with many pretenders to the throne, local feuds and external threats from the ever-expanding Ottoman Empire and the mighty Hungarian Kingdom. Among the long list of rulers was a 15th century Wallachian prince, Vlad III Dracula. He ruled over the principality three separate times during his lifetime. Most of the information regarding his life has been pieced together with fragments of surviving sources, as many details have been destroyed during Ottoman invasions, wars, and time in general. He enjoyed another nickname, namely Tepesh, which means as much as Impaler. And there is a good reason for this. Vlad III may have very well been one of the bloodiest and most brutal rulers of his day. And that really says a lot. Somewhere in the 1390s, the then ruler of Wallachia, Mercia I, had an illegitimate son. This Vlad II was sent to the court of his on-again, off-again ally, Hungary's King Sigismund. Throughout the years, the king recognized him as a legitimate Wallachian voivode. He made him a member of the Order of the Dragon in 1431, founded by the king to fight the enemies of Christianity. Vlad's membership resulted in his nickname Dracul and the founding of the House of Draculeshti. It would be one of his sons who would become famous all over the world for his brutality. Born in 1431 in Sigishoara, Transylvania, Vlad III was born as one of four sons. His nickname soon became Dracula, which means as much as son of Dracul. Five years after his birth, Wallachia's voivo died and his father seized the throne, moving the family to Wallachia's capital, Targovište. Considering Wallachia was an Ottoman vessel, for a few years a Hungarian-supported capture of the throne unnerved the Sultan. As little Vlad received an education in languages, sword fighting and horse riding, there was significant turmoil in the region, which would soon change his life for good. In 1437, King Sigismund of Hungary passed away. With Hungary's figurehead gone, an era of domestic instability followed. The Sultan wanted to invade Hungary, trekking through Wallachia. Ignoring pleas from Hungary and likely understanding the might of the ever-expanding Ottoman Empire, Vlad turned his back on his former ally. He allowed the Sultan to use Wallachia as a springboard into Transylvania multiple times. In 1441, Hunyadi and Vlad met at Targoviste, with Hunyadi reminding him of his pledge to the Order of the Dragon. Still, Vlad refused to recount his vassalship to the Sultan, but declared neutrality during a subsequent invasion into Transylvania by the Sultan. He simply let the Ottomans pass. Hunyadi defeated them at Hermannstadt. This humiliating defeat made the Sultan suspicious of Vlad's true intentions. Soon after, the Sultan invited both Vlad and another vassal, the Serbian despot Durat Brankovic, to his court. Durat refused, but Vlad came nonetheless, taking his two youngest sons with him. Upon their arrival, the Sultan imprisoned them on Gallipoli. He made Vlad swear an oath of loyalty, pay an annual tribute, and supply young men for the Devshirme system. Dracula and Radu remained in Edirn, the Ottoman capital, to ensure the Wallachian lord would remain loyal. During his absence, the rival Dineshti house seized the throne, and sources are a bit vague about how Vlad recaptured the throne upon his return. One year later, Hunyadi and the Hungarian king embarked on the so-called Long Campaign, capturing Nish, Krusevac and Sofia before retreating due to severe winter. Hunyadi followed the campaign up with another crusade against the Ottomans. Vlad continually revoiced his reluctance, but sent a contingent of approximately 4,000 horsemen commanded by his son Mercia. Hunyadi embarked with his king Vladislav, Mercia and Rome's legate cardinal Cesarini to once and for all expel the Ottomans from Europe. Skanderbeg too pledged his support, but Bramkovic figured his best chance at retaining his territories was remaining neutral, and either he or local Ottoman commanders blocked Skanderbeg from sending his troops to support the Crusaders' army. Troops from the Papal States did not arrive either. Not a great start. At the 1444 Battle of Varna, Vlad's predictions came true. The Crusaders were badly beaten, the Hungarian king was slain, and Hunyadi barely escaped with his life. News reached the Sultan of Vlad's insubordination by supplying troops for the crusade. Instead of executing his boys, the Sultan allowed them to remain at court, continuing their education. Both took very differently to the capture. Radu began identifying with the Ottomans, whereas Dracula retained a deep-seated hatred for his captors. Surviving reports describe how Dracula often lashed out at teachers, receiving severe punishment. We know more about Radu. He became a court favorite and even became good friends with Murat Son, the future Sultan Mehmed II. Vlad's relationship with Hungary deteriorated after the Battle of Varna. 
Vlad made peace with the Ottomans and supported an opponent of Hunyadi vying for the Moldavian throne. In summer 1447, Hunyadi unexpectedly invaded Wallachia to deal with the insubordinate ruler. Vladislav II, the pretender to the Wallachian throne, accompanied him. They captured Vlad, had him and his oldest son Mercia executed. Vladislav took over the court and began his rule as a new voivode of Wallachia. Learning of Hunyadi's actions, the Sultan decided Dracula's time had come. His chance came when, a bit over half a year after Vladislav claimed the Wallachian throne, the Hungarians launched another crusade. As a Hungarian vassal, it was expected Vladislav contributed troops, but in addition, it turned out he was one of its commanders. Exploiting his absence, an Ottoman contingent with Vlad Dracula marched into Wallachia while the Crusaders fought the 1448 Battle of Kosovo. Then, after a brief bloody coup, he installed himself as voivode at Targoviste while the Ottomans conquered strategic fortresses such as Djurju. The Ottomans defeated the Crusaders at Kosovo, making the situation seem even more hopeful for Dracula initially. However, upon their retreat, the battered crusading army received news of Dracula's takeover. Hunyadi, who retreated to Buda via Serbia, was captured by the Serb despot Brankovic. Still, Vladislav marched enough troops over the border to shoot Dracula away. Choosing to reclaim his throne rather than help the imprisoned Hunyadi, who had to pay a significant sum for its release, soured the relationships between both rulers. A deterioration that would ironically play into Dracula's cards, albeit in multiple years. In exile, Dracula first resided in a Dirne, but soon traveled to neighboring Moldavia. His whereabouts the next few years are murky. Some sources state he returned to Edirne, others that he remained in Moldavia, and yet others that he settled in Transylvania. All that is for sure is that a letter from July 1456 survives. In it, Hunyadi writes that he entrusted the defense of Transylvania's borders to Dracula. By this time, Vladislav realized he could not resist the Ottomans and drifted away from Hunyadi. He, in turn, likely figured Dracula was his next best bet. In summer 1456, all European eyes were set on Belgrade as Hunyadi's relief force marched onto the fortified city to relieve an Ottoman siege. Meanwhile, to the east, Dracula commanded a small contingent of soldiers crossing the Wallachian border. Vladislav intercepted his troops near Targshore. Chronicles describe how Vladislav agreed to single combat with him, upon which Vlad killed the ruler. Hunyadi relieved Belgrade, one of the greatest military victories of his lifetime. The fact he passed away one month after writing that letter must have been as unexpected to Dracula as it was to himself. Following Hunyadi's death, a bloody rebellion broke out within Hungary. It was not concluded until his son Maciasz Corvinus became king two years later. Corvinus would become very important in Vlad's life, both as an ally and enemy. Vlad's first reign was full of terror and surprisingly autonomous from both the Ottomans and Hungarians. The boyars, nobles, who killed his father and older brother years before, were the first to suffer from his vengeance. He organized a feast and invited all boyars. It became a red wedding style feast, for all boyars were impaled on stakes while Dracula enslaved their sons. Forced to construct his Punari castle, those who survived the grueling slave labor were impaled afterwards nonetheless. Surviving records reveal that council members he deemed inefficient disappeared, not to mention the public impalements of those he considered spies or actively working against him. Often, after execution, it would surface that his victims remained loyal to him to their death. Still, even for that time, Vlad employed an incredibly diverse court of Hungarians, Serbs, Moldovans, and even Ottomans and Tatars. He minted his own coins, much to the disapproval of Hungary as Wallachia and the Kingdom had been a monetary union since 1424. Although he signed treaties agreeing to defend Transylvania's borders and Hungarian merchants, in practice, within a few days after signing of the treaty, the Ottomans already raided the Transylvanian periphery. Dracula was a rogue lord, agitating both the Hungarians and Ottomans. Thanks to his Ottoman education, Dracula made sure his troops were up to the task of fighting them, Sources reveal that his soldiers were some of the first Europeans to use arquebuses in battle, and his siege equipment was also considered very modern. Ruling with an iron fist domestically, he began influencing surrounding territories. In 1457, he helped his cousin Stephanus III to seize Moldavia's throne. 
to the west of Wallachia lay Serbia. Brankovic had died a few months after Hunyadi, and three years later the Sultan finally annexed what was left of Serbia. The final buffer between the Ottomans and Hungary, Transylvania and Wallachia had disappeared. But bad blood between Corvinus and Dracula led to anything but a united front. The Wallachian lord had acted against ethnic minorities who supported Corvinus. He, in turn, supported two pretenders to the Wallachian throne and prevented Brasov merchants from selling arms to the Wallachians. But the two men would soon come to an understanding. Because in 1459 a contingent of sultans and emissaries arrived, notifying Dracula of his obligation to pay tribute and supply 500 Wallachian boys from the Devshirmi system. He did not take kindly to the demands and instead impelled the emissaries, sending a letter to Brasov to warn them of a probable Ottoman invasion. Another version of the story goes that Dracula had the emissary turbans nailed to their heads. That same year, Pope Pius II called for a crusade, leading to an alliance between the figure at Machias Corvinus and Dracula, who fully turned his back to the Ottomans. Moreover, Corvinus proposed Dracula marry his niece, something he seemed open to. The Sultan was besieging Corinth when news reached him of the killed emissaries and Vlad's alliance with the Hungarians. So he sent 23,000 troops across the Danube, but instead of immediate fighting, Dracula invited the Ottoman commander to his court. When he arrived, Dracula captured him and had him and 40 of his men impaled. Then he lined them up around the walls of Tarluvishta. It was a gruesome affair, and it is pretty clear why Dracula's moniker Tepesh, meaning as much as Impaler, was so fitting. A year of skirmishes followed, with him recapturing most fortresses on Wallachian territory, eventually pushing the Ottomans back over the river. Emboldened by his success and understanding the fully burned bridges with the Sultan, he took a huge gamble. In February 1462 he crossed the Danube into Bulgaria. He subdivided his army into small contingents, all raiding settlements and strongholds along the Danube. And even recaptured Giurgiu. According to chroniclers, he disguised himself as an Ottoman commander and told the citizens to open the gate in fluent Turkish. Once inside, he ordered his men to exterminate every living thing inside. He perpetrated a massacre against converted Bulgarians and Ottomans throughout the entire territory, impaling tens of thousands. A letter he wrote to Corvina survives. I have killed peasants, men and women old and young, who lived at Obluzitsa and Novo Selo, where the Danube flows into the sea, up to Rahova, which is located near Chilia, from the lower Danube up to such places as Samovi and Zijin. We killed 23,884 Turks, without counting those whom we burned in homes, or the Turks whose heads we cut by our soldiers. Thus, your highness, you must know that I have broken the peace with him." The unhinged flood was becoming a significant problem for the Sultan. In summer 1462 he raised a 90,000 strong army and crossed the Danube at Nicopolis into Wallachia to finish him off once and for all. A fleet occupied the port city Braila and burned it to the ground, while two leading regiments marched onto Takovishta. They fought several skirmishes while Vlad retreated each time. It was a hot summer and Vlad employed scorched earth tactics every time he fled. Before two weeks, the Ottoman troops were overheated, dehydrated and exhausted. Still, they reached Targovishta. Before laying their siege, they set up camp. During the night, Dracula took between seven and 10,000 men, divided them into two groups and attacked the military encampment in an attempt to assassinate the Sultan. Unsuccessfully so. Enjoying minor successes, the Ottomans eventually defeated his army and he could do no more than retreat. But when they entered Targovishta, they found nothing short of a ghost town. Impaled bodies of men, women, children of all ethnicities lined the streets. Vlad had left the Ottomans, a grim spectacle. In the east, another problem emerged for Vlad. Stephen III of Moldavia made use of the fact Dracula was preoccupied with the Ottomans and besieged the city of Chilia. It was an important port which used to be Moldavian, and Stephen now thought he could easily reclaim it. Instead, Dracula tried to put up a fight commanding an army of 6,000. But as he went on his way to lift the siege, another problem emerged. His estranged brother Radu, a friend of the Sultan, accompanied him on the military campaign. While in Wallachia, he campaigned among the boyars to accept him as legitimate ruler. 
Dracula never reached Chilia, and after several skirmishes between Radu and his army, he retreated into Transylvania, effectively losing this throne. Hoping to receive support from Corvinus, instead he ran into trouble. It is not entirely clear why, but likely upon believing forged letters stating that Vlad had concluded an alliance with the Ottomans, Corvinus imprisoned him in Visigrad for over a decade. It took many repeated requests to Corvinus by both him and Stephen to set him free. Stephen's motives were simple. He fought serious wars against the Ottomans and required a fellow anti-Ottoman ruler in the region. Eventually, Corvinus agreed as long as Vlad married his niece and converted to Catholicism. He agreed, married Justina Silaj and had two sons. Upon release, he vied for revenge. A year before his release, Radu passed away after an on-again, off-again reign for 13 years. Basarab III succeeded him. Dracula convinced Corvinus he was meant to lead an anti-Ottoman campaign, and frankly, he probably was Corvinus's best bet. He first helped the Hungarians relieve a siege of the Bosnian Sabac. He then went on to besiege Srebrenica, seizing the city and pillaging it within weeks. They moved against Kuslat, emerging victorious, and finally surrounded Zvornik. Contemporary witnesses write that the unhinged Dracula would impale Ottomans who surrendered, often tearing them apart barehanded. Moving into Transylvania, Dracula met up with a large army of Transylvania's voivode, Stephen Batori. In November 1476, a combined force of Hungarians, Wallachians and Moldovans under Stephen III marched into Wallachia. They emerged victorious in battle against Basara, nearby Bucharest, taking over the capital Targovista as well. Ten days later, they crowned Dracula as voivode of Wallachia. He invited the merchants from Brasov to trade again. Stephen left for Moldavia but left behind 200 loyal bodyguards because he understood the treacherous nature of the nobles who welcomed Dracula, but previously supported his brother in Basarab. And it turned out he was right. Nearly two months later, Basarab led a large Ottoman army back into Wallachia. With most of the Hungarians and Moldavians returning home, Dracula's army was heavily outnumbered. Engaging in battle, many of the nobles and Wallachians defected. It would lead to his ultimate end. Chronicles recount how he met his end in battle after being mortally wounded by a janissary. His corpse was beheaded and his head was sent to the Sultan. Some sources detail how janissaries played kickball with it for days. Other chronicles describe how he was quartered or impaled. All that is sure is that Vlad Dracula is undoubtedly one of the most famous medieval rulers of the region. It is very well possible he served as the inspiration for Bram Stoker and the world-famous 1897 novel Dracula. Vlad's son Minea ruled Wallachia decades after his father's death, although the unstable political situation led to nothing more than a short-lived reign and inevitable assassination. Thank you very much for watching this video. If there is a topic or event you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also really like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you already gain access to the exclusive Patreon series. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.